Hello everyone, today we talk about the Kingdom of Leon, an independent realm situated in the northwestern region of the Iberian Peninsula, lasting from 910 until uh, the early 19th century. Reino de Leon in Asturian, Reino de Leon in Spanish, Regnum Legionense in Latin, we will see now the etymology of the same Leon, which is Legion. Right, because of the seventh that was stationed there in later times. Um, the Kingdom of Leon was founded, as we said, in the early 10th century when the Christian rulers of the Asturias, and I made a video about the latter's kingdom, still along uh, the northern coast of, of, the, of the peninsula, shifted their center, their capital, their political center from Oviedo to the city of Leon. Right? Um, so the kings of Leon named uh, like this because of, of the different center and as we will analyze now uh, fought quite a lot of say dynastic struggles that uh, were also intertwined with essentially the different uh, you know, pushes coming from the within uh, of the realm, they were fighting against other uh, Christian neighboring powers, right? And they struggled, of course, against the Moors, but also the Vikings that invaded on different occasions, but to no avail as the realm uh, succeeded in protecting uh, its, own, uh, its own territory and uh, ceded the premises for its own fortune. As we will see better now, Garcia, the son of Alfonso III the Great of the Asturias, was the first of the uh, rulers that described themselves as uh, kings of Leon, right? We know this from the charters, right? So, this is also a fairly early time in, in a region that didn't have such enormous connections with other Western um, realities. This is interesting to point out, right? How this, this power emerged from fundamentally a peripheral reality but succeeded in monopolizing, hegemonizing the, the entire uh, Iberian Peninsula, at least, you know, with, with its offspring uh, of Castile, and uh, we will see later. Um, but we do not know so much, too much, right? Uh, we will see it further as far as the also the, the connections with the papacy were concerned, etc. In any case, it's generally assumed that the older Asturian realm, that as you understand, didn't immediately change, say, okay, well, we'll just shift the capital, so from now on, where the kingdom of the oh, yeah, yeah, that's how it's good. Like, the, the thing was gradual in some way, right? So, it's thought at this point that um, part of the, the the change was catalyzed by the division of the, of the former uh, principality of the Asturias uh, among the three sons of, in fact, Alfonso the Third. Um, we mentioned Garcia that would rule in Leon, in fact, Ortonio in Galicia, and Fruela um, in Asturias, right? As Fruela the Second, by the way. Um, so this was completely normal. We have seen in other videos about the origins of Aragon, of, of Navarre, etc. The the complexity uh, of this, um, let's say, of the Northern Iberian dynastic issues that were all intertwined with this, if you want, still unstable polities as far as the uh, as the firm territorial bases right were concerned. There was a lot of infighting. But also, be exactly because of this reason, lots of opportunities, especially in the 10th century in Spain, like in other parts of the West, were taking on, a, in fact, a dynastic character because of the consolidation of the military class, of the militas, the knights, etc. Regarding this political turmoil, it's considered that um, the same uh, Garcia, Rodon, and Fuerla had participated in deposing their father of Fonte. Right. Garcia died in 914, and at this point Leon went to his brother Ordonia, who, as a consequence, ruled both Leon and Galicia. Um, so there was, of course, a, a background of broader 
ta- territorial recompaction uh, as an ambition, it's just as bit in the imperial nature of these powers, uh, it was increasing, right, in its push towards the south in some way. Uh, Ordonio died um, 10 years later, 924, so that all these possessions went to the last surviving brother, Fruela, who, uh, however, lived just uh, another year, uh, dying of leprosy, 925. As a consequence, having all this, uh, this, this brothers died was a civil war, after which uh, Alfonso, who was the eldest son of Ordonio II, the one of Galicia, emerged as the new overruler, as Alfonso IV, right? So taking on the, the legacy of his, uh, of the Asturian uh, realm at this point, based on Leon, reigning from 925 to 932. There was a further power struggle when Ramiro, the um, younger brother of Alfonso IV, another son of Ordonio II, became king in 932. He captured his brother, Alfonso, as well as three sons of Fruela II, his cousins, um, Alfonso, Ordonio, and Ramiro. I don't know that Spanish history is messed up as far as you know the names, that, because there are so many politics, but they, they had all basically the same names, so... The titles of this and that are sometimes difficult to memorize, but that's also history. Um, so we we do not know exactly when or in which circumstance Alfonso IV died. In any case, he had left two infant sons called Ordonio and Fruela. Surprise, surprise. Um, so when Ramiro, his brother, died in 951, he left two sons too. Guess which name they had, Ordonio and Fruela, right? From two different wives, by the way. Um, Ramiro dies in 951, and his elder son, Ordonio III, rises to the pa- power of, of Leon. Right? He rules from 951 to 56, and he dies suddenly, uh, a bit older than 30 years old. He was succeeded by his younger half-brother, Right, uh, the other the, the were legitimate ones. Uh, Sancho the first, known as the Fat, who ruled for uh, ten years until 966. Um, the reason why he succeeded, by the way, um, his brother is that uh, the latter had failed to produce a legitimate heir by that point. So what is interesting is here we've seen it in, in the video about the king of the Asturias is the the progression right from let's say, a horizontal to a vertical kind of inheritance, right? Before all the, say, the brothers constituted, according to sort of tribal tradition, the like the, the hairs that had all to, to pass before their children could start, um, say, doing the same, uh, which, as you understand, is not uh, a recipe for great political stability. That's the point, right? Here, instead, the, the regime has become more dynastic, and there is a, it corresponds, of course, to a greater level of power concentration, of which, as we will see better later, Leon was the center, right, favoring a general stabilization of this polity, and and of course, in this regard, gravitating towards ever more stable, more more important centers, as it would happen from like the passage from Leon to to Toledo, and you will see that too. Now, Sancho I's son, Ramiro, uh, was born in 961, and he was five when his father died. He was also the only legitimate member of at least the direct family line. His mother was Teresa Ansurets, who uh, was would be a regent for her son for four years. Right, She had retired to the recently founded monastery of San of the Asturias, as we've seen a bit like the, the, the spiritual founder of the entire um, dynasty, which um, her sister, in, uh, say, Teresa's sister-in-law, Elvira, was the abbess. Was another nun, uh, Sancho's full sister, Elvira Ramirez, so you understand also in women, you know, that the, the onomastic fantasy didn't, didn't vary particularly much, 
um, Wu um, emerged as a regent for 13 years um, during the long minority like of of Ramiro uh, until 80. Right? She ruled from essentially from 962 to 975. Now, this was a difficult time, as you understand, not just for dynastic reasons, though, because of the attacks of the Vikings that were successfully repelled from the coast of Galicia, but still causing um, significant damage to, to the country. In 968, Gunrod, uh, a Viking warlord from Norway, um, established himself on the same Galician territory and held out for a year and a half. Uh, famously enough, the bishop Cisnando Menendez of Iria Flavia, uh, that is Compostela, in, in Galician, died fighting against uh, the Viking. And his um, episcopal successor, St. Rudesind, carried on the struggle until the Galician Count Gonzalo Sanchez defeated the invaders, killing Gunrod himself. Right, These were, were very brutal and ferocious struggles, we will see them in detail a bit better, but um, it, it's also not so just uh, clearly cut in terms of allegiances, because Vikings were used as war bands by other Iberian lords um, in the process, uh, etc. And at a point, even the same kings of, of Leon uh, uh, used this part of these adventurers uh, for their end. Uh, so this first, um, this Gunrod's expedition was completed by the destruction of the entire Norse fleet by the Count Sanchez. In 1008, um, some uh, other uh, Norse attacked Galicia, going as far as destroying Santiago de Compostela, together with um, other 17 Galician towns, right? Uh, the same Olaf Haraldsson, the, the future uh, Saint Olaf, right? The King of Norway from 1015 to 1028, raided um, the Iberian Atlantic coast, right? So there was quite an activity there, and the, the reason why the the, Vi the the Vikings were, as you know, quite uh, some globe trotters, right? But the um, the hardest hits, of course, were carried out in this say, in Northern Europe, and when you look at uh, the north of Spain, still this had, uh, you know, very similar characteristics uh, still at that point, with some other parts, especially of the Celtic fringe, right? It was actually more, more compact, because powers like the Leonese one were substantial, right? But the, exactly because of the width of this territory, it was not possible to simply defend successfully with a major force every, especially this, this peripheral um, areas, right? However, the local counts, uh, assisted by the, the sovereign authority, managed to put an end um, w to these attacks, right? That were really serious, like the lands of the north of Spain, um, in so Christian territory, by the way, were, were attacked by the Vikings in 1028, 1032, 1038. These were mostly... Uh, controlled by uh, the Leonese, right? Um, but the same Christian powers of northern Iberia used the Viking warbands uh, essentially against one another. It was actually pretty common. The Carolingians had done the same, um, throwing the various Norse armies at each other, etc. So this was still a way to channel these forces through somehow co-opting them and or, you know, uh, exploiting them before getting rid of them because that, that's how it normally happens during the second during invasions in general and this uh, this uh, even though persistent still a temporary phenomenon without essentially the establishment of any permanent uh, lordship uh, in the land or and very shortly even when when this happened as we've seen before now um the county of castile we will see later how it formed at this point, split off as a autonomous power, essentially, um, in 931. Uh, so would the county of Portugal, 
200 years later, in 1139, I made a video about medieval Portugal that, in fact, starts, um, say, from uh, about the kingdom of Portugal, because that's an important thing, starting from from this year, where I explained more in detail how, how it occurred. Um, this were relatively peripheral regions compared to Leon, right? Um, uh, in in this event, essentially part of the same Leonese territory was joined to the what would become the Kingdom of Castile. Um, this happened in 1230. I will admit, uh, make a video about the Kingdom of Castile because, of course, uh, as you understand here from the Asturias to Leon, it's the natural progression, so we'll see that better. In any case, from 1296 to 1301, the Kingdom of Land w w was again independent. Uh, the reunion with Castile um, would occur, but um, the Leonese crown remained uh, until 1833, right? Uh, which is important because you know that even though Castile and Aragon and their dependencies were dynastically united in 1471, they were actually different countries until basically the 18th century. Right, so as we talk about the unification of Spain, Spain is enormous to say the least, and very different um, within within herself. Uh, so all these countries maintained some important degree of autonomy. It was also institutionally recognized as a part of, say, of a monarchic, say, the, the dynastic possession of single monarchs, of single um, royal line. So, uh, given what happened in the 19th century, the Kingdom of the Leon was um, essentially transformed in, in a pro, uh, say, it was in, in, a, in a region, in turn split into provinces, uh, Leon, Zamora, and Salamanca. However, at the end of the 20th century, in 1978, these three provinces were um, of the region of Leon were included along the six historical ones of the um, old Castilla region to create essentially the autonomous community of Castilla and Leon, right? Still, however, great parts uh, of the former um, kingdom of Leon today integrate these provinces, right? And uh, the autonomous communities of Extremadura, Galicia, and Asturias. Uh, in Spain, plus northern Portugal, right? So, uh, this legacy is to be considered also in, uh, even after the contemporary administrative readjustments. Now, as I was uh, hinting at before, the city of Leon, that was the, the center of the realm, as, as we've seen, was founded um, by the Roman Legio Septima Gemina. Right, the, the seventh legion, the twin seventh legion, one of the most historical, um, famous ones, uh, the um, legion headquarters in late Roman Empire was the center, which had quite an appeal because of the gold mines present at Las Med Medulas, essentially a, a site, right? It's quite picturesque, inserted it here also from. For a naturalistic, um, for a naturalistic reason, We're talking about the Comarca of El Bierzo as a, as a more specific reference. Um, so we could make a, a detailed history of, of those times. Probably we will, uh, in some other, say, less short introductions, do uh, more in-depth stuff um, of the bigger cycle here. But Leon went through basically the, the standard pack like of Spanish history here. In 540, the city was conquered by the Aryan Visigothic king Ludwig Gilt, who, by the way, wouldn't harass the, um, the well-established and prevalent Roman Catholic population, especially that far in the, um, say, in the northwest, who was also intelligent, just not to, to pressure too much. In 717, Leon fell to the Arabs. However, it was also one of the first centers um, taken back the earliest by the uh, Christian Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula. 
And as we've seen in the video about the Kingdom of the Asturias, it um, was included in the latter uh, as early as 742. Mm, at that time, Leon was not so big as it would become later. It was actually a small town, but it, it had, importantly, a Roman foundation, right? So this provided her with some significant infrastructural relevance. For example, the surviving Roma, uh, Roman walls um, that uh, over which the, the medieval ones were added, by the way. Um, also, it was an important Christian center, as we've seen. Uh, in Visigothic times, it served as a bishopric, uh, and uh, the incorporation into Asturias brought the, um, let's say, the, 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 the center into, the ecclesiastical center into an early um, mechanism of, uh, say, unification of the Iberian Church, which had not been mm, feasible in Visigothic times because of the tensions that had been existing, like the not much only because of religious reason between the Arians and the, the Catholics, but just because politically the realm was very difficult to, to keep together, um, to say the least. Right, so at that by this point there are the Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula, but this power in the north is the one that starts to become um, that uh, to, to eventually become hegemonic um, and um, essentially consolidating the most sound uh, feudal um, territorial structure that also conferred the ecclesiastical provinces a, a specific order. Right, so Leon began to increase in prestige. Uh, at that time. Leon was, um, as we've seen, created as a separated realm when uh, the Asturian ruler, Alfonso III, split his realm among his three sons, just while essentially being involved in, it, in the pressure of, of theirs. Garcia I, ruling from 910-914 in it, and he moves the capital from Oviedo um, in the story to, to, to Leon. He was succeeded by Ordoño II, who ruled for other 10 years. Uh, the latter was also uh, a renowned commander, right? He fought uh, pretty hard against the Moors, right, uh, with uh, successful raids going as far south to Seville, Cordoba, and Guadalajara. Uh, so this was probably the heartland of the Islamic power in the peninsula. Naturally, the situation was uh, never really made um, so many uh, episodes about Cordoba. We will have to, because, of course, it was a, a very deep intertwinement of all these, even this northern polities with uh, the Islamic uh, government um, and uh, a lot of interplay and military influences as well between one another. In any case, these raids were uh, successful as far as plundering and loot was, was achieved. We will see how this, this is basically the prehistory of the Parius system that uh, the, the Kingdom of Leon would also uh, successfully exploit. Uh, after a few years of internal struggles during the uh, rule of Fruela II, Alfonso Froilat, that was his uh, son, and Alfonso IV, Ramiro II uh, assumed the throne, ruling for 20 years, from 931 to 51. And under his reign, Leon stabilized uh, significantly uh, as a policy. Uh, Ramiro II was also a good commander. He defeated Islam the Islamic forces uh, in their own territory as well. That was basically a, a proof, right, of a test of your um, leadership uh, in many ways. These were all pretty warlike, kind of feudal-minded, um, you know, uh, powers to a degree. At least they, they were growing feudal, but their great part of their success also depended on the, the deterrent capacity, again, to uh, mount up these expeditions, leading them, bringing back wealth right from, from the much richer south, uh, etc. Also, Ramiro carried out 
um, expeditions turning the valley of the Dura River into de facto um, um, a desolated area, at least a no man's land that separated the Christian North and the Islamic South. For this reason, um, Ramiro was known by the Muslims as the devil, right? As his uh, great military skill seemed supernatural and obviously, you know, as a challenge to the divinely ordered uh, Islamic uh, state. Um, so, uh, as the Leonese were advancing, they were trying, let's say, to consolidate their territories by repopulating the Meseta High Plains, right, through this process, the, the repoblacion, right, uh, carried out um, mostly during the night, but also the 10th century, um, between the River Duero and the Cantabrian Mountains. The process occurred mostly from immigration uh, from Galicia, and especially from Asturias and Leon. This migration brought to the extension of what is today essentially the Leonese language. That, like, if if you look at the Reconquista map uh, and you consider the languages, you realize that there were these sections, like the various countries that existed in the north, like horizontally aligned, right, longitudinally aligned. And so when they pushed south, they all like they began to go down as tribes, right? So. Uh, making the conquered lands essentially speaking their own language. There are uh, countless debates, uh, as far as I understand, in Spanish um, history, linguistics, etc., because nobody really knows with certainty how the Islamic uh, ruled population uh, was organized, like what kind of cultural languages, the hand, like the, it's mostly hypothetical because the level of, of, of documentations are very different, right? And as we've seen also just the one of the Christian North is not overwhelming either, right? But at least um, we know later that from from these northern lands, most of the, the, the dialects spoken were essentially uh, taking over the, the southern ones, right? Um, so the, the repoblacion um, was um, of course a also a moment of synthesis of not of just a replacement, as um, the South was, generally speaking, more, more culturally advanced. Right, there was Mozarabic art, right, as an Ibero Romance one, uh, resulting from a mix of Visigothic, Islamic, and even Byzantine elements. On a very vast, again, land was also quite different. Right, different places of say Mozarabic area. Um, in any case, you can see these cultural influxes architectonically in the Leonese churches of San Miguel de Escalada and uh, of the one of Santiago de Peñalba. Uh, these are respectively in, um, let's say, in, uh, in, in Leon, right, on, on the way of St. James pilgrimage route and in the aforementioned region of uh, El Bierzo, in Ponferrada specifically. Now, during the early 10th century, uh, the Leonese uh, conquered land uh, not just south, but also east, right? So securing the territories that would become known as the county of Burgos. The latter's name comes from the uh, large amount of fortresses that existed there, so the Burrs, um, castles, but this, the 10th century is the, is the era of encastellation a bit par excellence, right? Um, giving the name to the land and consequently to the same Castile, right? Burgos remained within Leon until the 30s of the 10th century when Ferdinand II, Fernand González, the Count of Castile, um, essentially uh, became the, the first autonomous ruler of this land. It was called um, by him after the, all these castles, and so as you know, also in, in the Castilian coat of arms, you know, the, the castle standing out is still in, in the contemporary um, Spanish flag, uh, the reference to. So um, this this uh, this marks a bit of a, a turning point because uh, after that, the county of Castile would remain as de facto independent as hereditary 
Um, and eventually becoming also the most important part of this uh, previously Leonese domain. We, we talk about the, the kingdom of Castille and Leon, um, but it, it, it's in the, uh, even though it, it emerged in, in the latter, right, as a, as a polity, like it's, it's the former that takes over, right? Ferdinand took for himself properly the, the title of count, right, and continued expanding uh, his uh, power at the expense of the same Leonese uh, territories, also allying himself with the same caliphate of Cordoba until 966 when he was defeated, however, by uh, Sancho I of Leon, the fat that we remembered uh, before. Um, th this aspect is interesting because it tells you how, like in the, like we will see it, this is a bit the history of Castile even even later on, of course, the most important amount of manpower and agricultural resources and so on came from the south, right? So even though the northerners conquered this area, still they and they and these rulers essentially come from this this process. Still, the it, it was the south who would become the the center of power, and gradually we've seen it just here with with Oviedo in, in the far north and then Leon gradually south and eventually Toledo, right? So it's kind of obvious. That's where the greatest amount of wealth and power was concentrated. There are other parallelisms in, in European history, by the way. Now, we can say that the, the apogee of the Leonese realm was, um, say, during the, the 11th century. Right, because um, the kingdom continued to be the most important at this point of the Iberian Peninsula in spite of the internal issues. The most powerful, but not necessarily, uh, say, on a, in terms of, 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 um, of regime, as it's proven by the uh, Navarre takeover of Castile in the 20s of the 11th century. This occurred under Sancho Garcés third of Navarre, ruling between 1004 and 35, um, this guy arrived to uh, administrate the same Leon in the last year of his life. The only territory of the Leonese ruled to remain independent from, from the Navarre race was Galicia in the far n northwest, right? Um, but naturally this shows how permeable at that point Leonese power was, or at least how intertwined uh, the uh, northern Iberian powers uh, really were, and how some kind of ones that had more concentrated power in a given um, political um, realm could, could even push their boundaries forward, like as dynastic rulers of lands that, however, had been already affirmed as uh, countries uh, on the road. And in the division of lands which followed uh, Sancho III's death, his son Fernando succeeded to the county of Castile. We are in 1035. Two years later, um, uh, Fernando defeats the king of Leon, who died in battle, and given that he was married to the Leonese king's sister, he became the ruler of Leon and Galicia as well. Right? Uh, we've seen this in the video about the origins of, of Navarre, Ber um, Catalonia, and, uh, Aragon, etc. Right, but we'll come back on it also a bit more more in depth. So, thirty years after this, uh, until Fernando's death, essentially in 1065, um, this uh, line ruled over the Leonese kingdom and the county of Castile as well, right? Um, Ferdinand was known as the, the first, the great, of Leon, right? Um, after having defeated his brother-in-law and secured power there. Um, so early on in its history, Leon had the hot frontier in common with the Cordobans. Um, distance means a lot, of course, but uh, the Muslims had always, still by this point, like um, uh, reclaimed uh, control up to up to the very northernmost part um, of the peninsula. So 
uh, you couldn't quite escape as we were noticing before that the broader emerald um, polis, uh, politics uh, etc so in the 11th century as you know the al andalus uh, enters in a severe crisis mostly as far as the relation with the center were concerned uh, the Taifa's successor states uh, of the caliphate basically are the product of a sort of feudalization, decentralization, and the failure of the central state to maintain everything together after, you know, centuries of, of preeminence, of course. So, in many ways, and I made lots of videos about the Reconquista, so you know what I'm talking about in general uh, from basic history. Um, this meant really uh, the, the time turning uh for the uh say for the upper hand on the on the peninsula the christians begin from the north from their more their poor but more militarized um uh abodes to exert pressure on the typhus to enter more directly in their in their policy to ally themselves with some not just fighting against them and starting to exact as a form of protection uh, hush money, etc. The so-called parias. I made a video specifically about this. These were tributes, fundamentally, in return for favors um, to particular factions and or like simple extortion on, on the um, uh, sword tip. Uh, this brought also to the uh, to, to the acceleration, of course, of their conquista, the the entering of the, the northerners in, in a uh, previously unknown space uh, by a degree. The, the Parias uh, brought in lots of wealth, an unprecedented uh, amount. Um, the, uh, just to make an example, the aforementioned Ferdinand I of Castile, following the example of the Counts of Barcelona and the Kings of Aragon, um, essentially accumulated such a large amount of wealth that when he died in 1065 uh, the parias were institutionalized uh, as essentially separate sources of income for uh, his three sons inheritance right so that's the single chunks of, of territory that made up the country was normally now had um, had normally now a specific tribute system uh, established with uh, some Islamic lands in the south that normally kept paying them to receive this kind of, of protection. Um, this is quite um, fascinating. Um, so the other aspect we were looking at before is this relative isolation of uh, Leon and, and Castile uh, we have seen this in videos about Iberian warfare, the fact that the northwest was much more, the uh, northeast was much more influenced by Fra the Franks. Um, it looks much more, in fact, that, that kind of westerner uh, in many ways. This other, um, uh, say, this, uh, the, the Leonese, uh, in air, uh, say, power uh, as such, is instead a giant growing basically on its own. Right, there were scarce connections with the same Rome. Right, uh, we can say no contact. Right, but the point with the with the papacy had been receiving that essentially military and economical protection in exchange uh, for essentially the the barren acceptation of uh, the Roman right over the Visigothic one at the time of the Islamic conquest. So gradually, of course, this this country was being framed within the broader Frankish West um, as such. Um, but there was not much of an... It was a bit of a world on its own. Across the mountains, uh, in this essentially continental dimension, it acquires ever more, as Castille was the, the less even seafaring power in the later uh, Iberian ones, and the most feudal, the most monarchic, Right, and so developing also sort of um, of an ideology of its own um, uh, royal mystique, right, and uh, austerity, and uh, of course devoted 
to the cause of the Reconquista, uh, etc., to develop properly a, a style on its own. This is in part true also for Portugal, it's even more rigid in the, in the forms, in the, in the symbols. Um, there are some significant influences also from the north, but sometimes they are literally some, um, you know, knights errands, right, from places, I don't know, like France or wherever, that install themselves um, in this in this frontier, because there was nobody really stopping. It was, was a, a great far west, right, where you could create a scenery on your own, on the on the floor, on the base of force of arms. Um, there is, however, an international um, level um, that can be observed um, in, for example, the uh, the no nations that Ferdinand and his heirs, um, as rules of Castilla and Leon, made to the famous Abbe of Cluny. That at this point was to essentially uh, and deeply change. Uh, Western spirituality. Um, when uh, the abbot Hugh died in 1101, he was essentially building up the huge third abbey church, the sinecure of every eye, and so on. And um, this donation exemplifies, like the the sense of, of accomplishment, also that this monarchy could boast in front of its other continental, uh, say. Uh, kind. Another very important uh, source of prestige uh, and power was the um, the extension of the Way of Saint James to uh, to Santiago de Compostela, uh, to the supposed tomb of, of the saint um, that would become, in of itself, like a symbol of, uh, properly of the Reconquista itself, uh, etc. This, this way, uh, there were several branches uh, in, in Europe, right, from from, from England, okay, from France, Germany, Italy. I, I've inserted the, the picture here, and they basically had followed this path in the north of Spain, longitudinally arriving to Santiago, this is from the Atlantic side, on the very opposite. And so a great part of the Leonese kingdom developed uh, along this route, where the local rulers built large hostels and churches. Um, we are at the age of uh, the Romanesque style, right? And so the the affirmation together with it, properly with, with a sense of of order, of more permanent, um, uh, say, monarchic territorial controls, infrastructurally in the capacity of uh, even defending this 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 lands that had been, as we've seen been the target of Islamic as much as Viking raids of uh, pagan forces against the, the Christian shrine. Alfonso the Sixth um, was, um, say, ruling from 1065 to 1109. The son of Ferdinand the First was one of the most important rulers of Leon in medieval times. He took control first of uh, the Leonese, then uh, of Castilla and Galicia. And when his brother died, he um, took over the Leonese city of Zamora that had opposed him. At some point, he was crowned even Emperor of Spain, right, uh, over all the other rulers of the Iberian Peninsula, which was a claim, um, essentially um, the the taking of Toledo uh, open to that, uh, say, level of prestige. This was the old Vis Visigothic capital, basically the, the center of, of the peninsula as a wall. That's probably the turning point in uh, Reconquista history, uh, as far as, especially as the, pr the, the dominance of, of the Christians w was affirmed. Um, Toledo had an enormous spiritual prestige um, so, it, think about the councils of Toledo, one of my very first videos on Schwerpen was dedicated to this, and we will come back to that. Um, and, of course, there had been, essentially, a uh, Christian church in Islamic times, and the deal in, now we can't digress fully on, on the story, but I often discuss this in their Conquista videos, was controlling, through this city, a much larger amount of people, many of which were Jews and Muslims as well. So at this point, the title that the Christian uh, rulers of Toledo and especially the the, the, the Leonese, the Castilians, uh, start um, acquiring is the one properly of Imperator, 
right? There is a, an imperial tradition in Britain as much as in Spain, right? The idea that there was an entire and defined space to, to rule over, in this case the, the Iberian uh, plateau, um, that um, would make this ruler traditionally like the protectors of the pre-existing communities. I made a bit about the Mudayars, so the, the Jews, the Muslims that served in uh, Christian armies throughout all this time. Uh, the Christians too at some point sold their services to, to Islamic leaders um, as well. Uh, think about El Cid, etc. But this is not just um, about it. It's about the traditional role of protector that this ruler has to um, to, to be up to uh, in order to remain in charge. And this the, the conquest of Toledo opens, of course, to this new problem of uh, controlling a much wider amount of people, resources, and having to content them also sometimes at the expense uh, of the northerners. In fact, Toledo will gradually um, become more important than Leon within this... Um, this this policy um, and uh, and the, the mechanism here is fascinating there were Christian Mozarabs for from An Andalus that had come to north to populate uh, the deserted frontier land so there is or even in another pool of uh, say demographic pool that is used to repopulate those uh, territories that for centuries had been um, uh, say more sparsely inhabited because of the constant raids that were taking place. This frontier was shifted south uh, historically, right? Um, there is a sense that these Mozarabs were more educated. They were essentially bringing back the even much of the Visigothic um, culture, right? The Visigothic culture didn't survive in this north because they are the, the, the Visigothic, you know, they were the last to true. No, like the Visigoths had been the ones who had tried to conquer this north that were somehow um, even Celtic in nature and however Ibero-Roman by that point in resisting atrociously against the Visigoths. So most of Visigothic culture actually was surviving in the Islamic world. The same is true for classical culture. Toledo was one of the single most important centers of learning from which people from everywhere came to learn to translate like all the you know all the classics uh, filtered by Jewish and uh, Islamic literature that were being translated from people coming from uh, from from Western Europe that literally already knew the language because that's how actually advanced Western culture already was. Picking the books that they knew were there, um, translating them. So um, this was really an international center that the, the Reconquista especially opened to uh, to the Christian world more more greatly. Right, Christians were already present there and traveling there in Muslim times, but this opened, as we were saying before, also to. Uh, 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 an ecclesiastical restrengthening, a sort of re reorganization of this space was more accessible to say, the, 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 the Christian world uh, as a whole. Um, there were, um, interestingly enough, that there were some instances of a Reconquista that stemmed from the same Mozarabic world, right, against Moors and so on, so that, of course, it was about winning these people's, these inhabitants' favor that made uh, the alchemy. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the um, the 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 conquest of Toledo allowed also the Leonese Castilian armies to exert a much uh, greater territorial, um, say, much greater pressure on on the Moors that were not just now paying tribute, but properly seeing their territories conquered more and more widely. Um, still, would take a couple of centuries before the. You know the struggle was over. You could even say that you know that there was a you know a decisive turn. Um, as there were problems that often were also against the same among the same Christians. So Alfonso VI was, for example, drawing to local politics by strife within Toledo. It was a, an important center that had some sort of even, in fact, municipal autonomy. There were factions. There were policies again revolving around the, the entire peninsula passing through there. There was the big deal of the Catholic Bishop of Toledo that had 
to be appointed still through a criterion of respect of the local church was incredibly powerful since Visigothic times, because as you know, back in the day, they managed to practically oust um, the, the Visigothic monarchy, right, that controlled very few around Toledo, because the, the church represented in that sense the, the, the nobility that managed to, to, to actually weaken that monarchic system. Um, at the time, there was another interesting aspect that is, um, um, say, the presence of Islamic strongholds that kept depending on Toledo, um, uh, as they they had done in, in Islamic times. But now there was a Christian ruler wanted to keep receiving that the same, um, saying the same treatment, right? So these centers would pay in gold and they they would receive some further protection uh, it's similar to the Paris system but to the point that um that the muslims were not to be dislodged from there in the first place right because it had been normal uh, to to control this um this this world in general this was also a much more urbanized area in the first place so again the, the relation between the, the populations especially of the cities that were very often of Roman foundation, fortified, but very different from the average, at least comparing the average of, of, of the north, right? So it was really an important uh, turning point. Um, and this um, this brought also to, there were other factors, by the way, the, the kingdoms of Leon and Castile were split in 1157. Um, this was um, caused by a major defeat of um, Alfonso the Seventh of Castile. They also bore the title of emperor, right? Um, uh, and uh, the, especially the Castilian authority was weakened, so this separation occurred. But the control over Toledo continued, so it's as if the Leon had remained uh, a bit more aside, but also behind in in in, in the process. The last two kings of an independent Leonese realm um, to between 1157 and 1230 were Ferdinand II and Alfonso the uh, Ninth. Uh, Ferdinand led the Leon's conquest of Merida, uh, that was, um, you know, in the province of today, today's province of Badajoz, in um, in Extremadura. Uh, the city dating to, to Roman times was an important acquisition per se. Um, and Alfonso the Ninth is that besides conquering the wall of Extremadura, including the same uh, cities of Cáceres and Badajoz, um, was um, one of the most enlightened rulers uh, of his time, as he founded the very famous University of uh, Salamanca, that would remain a bit like the, the gold standard like of uh, the Spanish universities um, in uh, 1212, which is quite of a date because it's also the, the one of Las Navas uh, and uh, therefore the full, like the properly the break of the Islamic South, right? And after that was basically hegemonized by Castilla, consolidated. And so that's technically where the Reconquista ends because also the... The remainder of the, of, of the Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula at that point became vassals of, of the of the Christians, uh, and uh, the the Castilian rulers were, in fact, the ones benefiting benefiting the most from that enormous victory. I, uh, I still haven't made a bit about the battle, but say it's uh, an event of universal importance. Uh, the, there is the concert of the Iberian forces, the well, say the Frankish mercenaries. Uh, Innocent the Third. This was a time in which still the the Berber forces from North Africa were sending waves um, to sh trying to shatter, like to regain the initiative and conquering further land in the south. We've seen it especially in the bit about medieval Portugal that had more this more direct frontier. Alfonso also summoned in 1188 uh, one of the first parliaments um, in in Europe where the citizens were uh, represented. This were the Cortes of uh, Leon, what would become, in fact, the Cortes Generales in, in, um, as the bicameral the legislative ones uh, of chambers of Spain. Um, and this is, this is fascinating because it tells you again how, um, say, urban 
policy played a role at so such a, an early age uh, for what th this power had become. Here we're not even say we're talking about Leon specifically. So, but it it, it derived from a you know the, the broader the broader dominion and a representation from from broader lands to the same Leon. So uh, we are distancing ourselves. Um, Alfonso the Ninth was also pretty. Uh, proud legitimately about his realm, uh, his accomplishment, and he designated um, upon his death his heirs as Sancha and Dulce, that were the daughters of his first wife, and in order to maintain the independence of um, the, the kingdom, he uh, applied in his testament the uh, Galician rite of inheritance, um, that essentially granted men and women equality in succession, right? which was not a thing really elsewhere. Um, so this would have left Sancha and Dulce as the future queens of Leon. Um, however, when their father died in 1230, it was um, Alfonso's son by Berenguela of Castile, Ferdinand III, who assumed the Leonese crown after having invaded the land, right? So this brought him to be uh, a joint sovereign of both Leon and Castile after, uh, since the death of Alfonso VII in 1157. Um, in the meanwhile, the county of Portugal had basically uh, seceded. Uh, the Pope had recognized it in 1139 as a kingdom on its own. Uh, this wouldn't uh, actually save Portugal alone, but this gave some basis um, further, say, uh, say, international recognition of port the, 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 the existence of a Portuguese crown that would succeed, right, defeating the Castilian army in, in open field on multiple occasions to survive as one, because Portugal was just part of the previous system that was say it, it came to be as the modern country something I mean very gradually right and uh, because there is not like much boundary around right and one of the interesting aspects of this story is how say Spain and Portugal were two different countries historically while there is no major uh, divide but still I mean there, there actually is it was built uh, in the middle ages and one has to follow the political history to understand it better now, the union between Leon and Castille under Saint Dynasty was somehow resented by the Leonese, as you understand, because um, uh, they, they didn't like to be ruled now from Toledo, essentially, and there were some revolts aimed at um, possibly even seceding, right? Because at that point, again, it was a matter of personal uh, possession, right? The, the countries were traditionally two, right? They were not unified. Um, so, um, Alfonso X, uh, that was the son of, of, of the Ninth, restored the independence of the kingdom of, of uh, Leon, which was not, however, respected by his son and successor, Sancho the Fourth, because uh, his brother waited until 1296, and so when uh, Sancho died the year before, he was crowned as John I, was king of Leon, Galician Seville. Um, altogether, now, you understand now in a completely different picture where the Castilians had reached up to Sabia, um, the like uh, the Mediterranean, so a completely different story and situation uh, where the Castilian monarchy had dramatically strengthened in, in the meanwhile, so we'll have to see it as a separate thing. Um, so in 1301, um, what happened is that John uh, abdicated and the king of Castilla assumed the crown of Leon reuniting formally also the two kingdoms. Um, so, in theory, the Leonese uh, ancestral power was the superior one recognized in title, so much so that you have the lion as part of their standard, right? But Castille, as we were saying before, was uh, just taking over in so many ways. Also, the Leonese language was being replaced by Castilian. Um, the two countries did maintain, as it was normal at the time, different institutions, different parliaments, different flags. 
um, different cults of law, as it was absolutely normal until late modern era. Right, so that when at basically in the 8th and the 19th century, the Spanish monarchy begins to centralize, to unify, to, to in a in a, an administrative way, and so things uh, changed really. Um, and we will see perhaps this better uh, on another occasion. So I, as you understand, when I make this series, I eventually focus on one specific, let's say, development. There are countries that go on. Uh, for a long time, let's say if you want to focus medievally on them, uh, you want to highlight the moment of greater, say, uh, leadership, because they eventually get absorbed by others. There may be, as in this case, part of their own, say, creations or offsprings, at least as far as mostly a feudal uh, power was was concerned. I mean, if you if you think that uh, you know this started from an Asturian, a very modest mountain power, like in the in the eighth century, well, to come to, to to lead the process of Spanish unification, you understand that it's it's not like just the the merit of the very beginning, right? It's what happened in between, and that's really also very complicated, and so it requires a bit more of in uh, say of inquiry. Um, so this is. Um, this is pretty much it. Uh, we will keep talking about Leone's history in the future. For today, um, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel um, if you are interested in my upcoming content. Uh, as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.